Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this session called Science is the New Art. Uh, my name is Stephen Romay, I'm the books editor of the Australian newspaper and with me today have uh, two people who probably need little introduction so I'll be brief. Uh, Annie Prue is a novelist of works such as Postcards, The Shipping News, she won her the Pulitzer Prize I believe, and Accordion Crimes, and of course the story Brokeback Mountain, which was made into a wonderful film starring a very talented young man from this city. Her most recent book is Bird Cloud, which is a memoir of her efforts to build her dream home on some beautiful but, I think, slightly unforgiving land in Wyoming. Uh, now, we also have Tim Flannery, who is a scientist, a writer, a former Australian of the Year, and uh, quite recently was appointed to the government's Climate Change Commission, which I believe means he's going to explain climate change to all of us and, <laughs> and also explain the policy responses and options. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> His latest book is Here on Earth, which is ambitiously a biography of the planet and also of us as, as a species. So let's start. Science is the new art. Let's tackle this thorny question immediately. Um, Annie, we might start with you. What is science? What is art? How does each inform the other? I think that science is definitely the kinetic partner here. And I say partner because ideas fly back and forth and forth. And, Art and science bounce off each other all the time. Um, many examples of science from cartography to uh, music composition, um, a, a huge long list of things have uh, art in them, and much art has science in it. But essentially art, we speak of a work of art, uh, someone who is a practicing artist, whether a writer or a sculptor or uh, a potter, will have an idea in mind, maybe starting from the same kind of uh, starting line as a scientist with ideas, um, curiosity, um, a, a greediness to know, and... The end result, however, might be different. Uh, I think of the science as ongoing. It's never finished. The goal is never reached. Whereas the artist, after many trials and errors and false passes and sketches and, uh, and um, drafts and so forth, ends up with something which we can legitimately call a work of art and that often endures in its original shape for a long time. And it seems to me that that is the great difference with science. We don't say a work of science, do we? No. <laughs> Not generally, Annie. No, it's quite true. Sorry, I was very involved with what you were saying and, uh, and listening and, and not thinking I'd have to respond. But there we go. <laughs> you see, I, yeah, I think you're right. You see, when I think about art and science, I, I sort of, I, if you go back to the very origins of modern science, so right back to Francis Bacon's Silvum Silvarum and to, to the New Atlantis, you know, that, that incomplete work of fiction mm. that he wrote, explaining how science might be done. Um, you see there that, you know, even from 16, 1610, 1620 onwards, the, the two, art and science, are, are inextricably woven together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the books, I think, that probably had more impact on the world than any, well, any early science book was um, Robert Hooke's uh, Micropia, Microscopia, the book, mm -hmm. where, which was full of beautiful drawings of fleas <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so forth. And one of the reasons that it is such a compelling book is that the artwork is so compelling. Um, 
So I think they've always existed side by side, art and science. Um, and, 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 and you know, it's a false dichotomy. That's what I want to say. It's a false dichotomy. Because within the very broad church that is the sciences, um, there is some threads which are very, what I would call, reductionist, where science scientists look at ever tinier bits of a problem, and, and that's been the dominant thread. And that's why our universities are full of people who are experts on the salivary glands of the wombat or something like that. <laughs> you know, and and that's, that has its own value. Um, but there is also holistic science, people like James Lovelock and others mm. who uh, try to build a model world, a bit like Francis Bacon. You know, well, like a yourself. Model. Well, I guess, I guess so, yeah. Right. And that, is, that, that enterprise is much more akin to writing a novel or painting a painting or right. creating right. a piece of drama, I think. I quite agree. A question of horizons in both science and the arts Whoever is the the uh, operative can uh, draw his or her own horizon, and it can be tight and close, or it can be sort of elastic and ebbing and flowing and raising and lowering and uh, shredded and ripped down. So the the back and forth play though between science and art is there, and it's. It's fun. It's fascinating. We all want to know why things are the way they are. Uh, for myself, I'm incredibly interested in place. For me, uh, every story, every novel, every story, every poem, really every dinner conversation starts with place. Where we are, where we came from, what makes things happen in a particular region. There, uh, there's geography, there's climate, there's the weather, there's the rock underfoot. The things that happen, everything that happens there, the food that can be grown, what the people there eat, if there are people there, or other animals. But it depends on place, and the, the variations are enormous really enormous, but for me, that's where stories come from. Once you understand a little bit about a particular place, the stories are there, not one or two, but hundreds of them, hundreds of possibilities. Once you, once you have a feel for um, what makes that place the way it is at a particular time. You know, can I, I just want to ask, Annie, about your book, latest book, Bird Cloud, which I think is a really profound um, exposition of what you were just talking about at that place to me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what it did for... I've only been to, to um, Wyoming once, and I was a young, I was a young man, 1983. Um, and when I went there, I, it was one of the strangest experiences of my life because I felt I'd entered a mirror world there was this place that looked so much like Australia. Of mm -hmm. any part of the USA, <laughs> that is it. It looks like the western plains of New South Wales. Mm. But you somehow forget that you're a mile and a half up in the air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and these big fences that you see actually have a purpose. They have these big fences that would be 30 foot high and run for miles, it seemed to me, across the landscape, mm -hmm. which stopped the snow from blowing around. And... They are. But this is the, the most asked tourist question in Wyoming <laughs> is... What are those big fences? And they are. They're huge. They're about the size of from the first row to the back row. They're made of wood, and they're lined up to, uh, to catch the wind at a certain angle. Um, but I have heard that one lady came into the Forest Service people, and she said, I know what they're for. You sit on them to watch the wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I, might say, I did a bit of watching wildlife in Wyoming and some mm. of it in bars there, which was really interesting as a young man. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember I went into one bar. We were talking about this earlier on before you come on stage. I went into one bar where there's a rack at the door where you hang your six-shooter or lean your rifle up against it. Mm. And I just thought that was Wyoming. I thought every bar in Wyoming was, had one of these racks, and, and you destroyed my illusion this morning by saying you picked the one bar <laughs> <laughs> that had well, the cowboy bar or something. <laughs> yeah, it's called a cowboy bar in Laramie, and he just happened to walk into the 
the tough bar. There was another one called the buckhorn, which tried, but it just didn't have the, the same feisty flavor. But uh, the, these bars are scattered all over the place. The bar is the center of life in Wyoming. We're drifting away from the subject, eh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> I had a friend visiting from France one time, and it was a Sunday morning. Sunday follows on Saturday night. Um, we went down to a, a rather funky little bar about 30 miles away, which is just a few blocks in, in Wyoming terms. And to, to this bar, its main attraction was that it had a dance floor mounted on railroad boxcar springs. And when a good crowd of people got out there dancing, um, hilarity would take over and people would begin to jump up and down. And pretty soon you would spring up into the air rather high and people had thumbtacks and dollar bills and they'd stick them into the ceiling. So there's, there's about $10,000 worth of ones up on, the, <laughs> up on the ceiling. But we went down to this place, and we were going to have a drink and just look at the dollar bills. Uh, there was a big sign on the door in a wet spot on the porch, and the sign was freshly made, and it said, No knives or guns allowed. <laughs> and there had been a big knife fight the night before, so... Um, my friend from France was quite appalled, but uh, that's the old Wyoming. It's not like that anymore. Feel free to come. <laughs> <laughs> Just on that subject of sense of place, do you feel that it's something that in modern times we've lost a bit of? And in, in Bird Cloud, for example, you write about Native American Indians. The idea of buying and selling land is completely alien to them because it's not something that you own, it's something you belong to. Mm. And I, I thought, Tim, as well, you might talk about this, whether we need to reconnect more firmly with place in order to cherish it and save it. How do you do that, though? Yeah, that's right. I, see, I, I, maybe I can just speak about my Please. personal experience a bit with that. Uh, I live on a house on the Hawkesbury River, north of Sydney, which is really just a little fibro shack and it doesn't have air conditioning and there's only one, really, or two little rooms inside that are sort of really inside. The rest of it is outside, it's just a big veranda. Mm -hmm. And it's lucky that in that climate you can do it, even if you've got a rug up in winter and have a fire and in summer wander around stark naked. But in any case, <laughs> you sort of do engage with the world in a way in that environment you simply cannot in a more heavily built environment because the tides are there rising and falling twice a day which really connect very deeply with your body when you're actually seeing that and feeling that and the weather of course is just all around the stars are actually out there every night and you see them and you you feel you feel the weather on your skin you know, uh, and the birds and animals, you watch the rhythms of the birds and animals come and go. And it, it does something very profound to yeah. you. It roots you in a particular environment in a way that's very hard to articulate. Yeah, but, the local web of life. Yes, mm -hmm. but very real. Yes. And living in a flat in the city, which I've also done, where you are cut off and you, the AC is running and it's very comfortable and lovely, it is almost impossible to have that sense of connectedness, yeah. I think. It's, it's not the same as... You, you can't just go out uh, for your summer holiday and, and camp or hike or whatever. You can't go out for a couple of weekends. It's just not the same. You have to be in it. Mm. And... That way you do learn the plants, you do learn the animals, you become familiar, and you become familiar to the local animals too. Uh, they do recognize people. Um, that brings up that fellow at the University of Maine, Barrett, who was uh, doing a lot of raven experiments, and some of his graduate students had to catch ravens and banned them and so forth. And the ravens, after they were released, remembered those students' faces. And whenever they appeared on the campus, the ravens would be there shrieking and shouting and, and flying low and, and cussing them out. So, 
It's, it's funny, it gives you a totally different sense of that relationship with animals. So, you know, where I live, we have a, an animal called a king brown snake, which is a very venomous snake and really? widely regarded as very dangerous. And because the house is open, they can sometimes even try to come inside. And they'll be, as, you know, from, they'll be two, over two metres long and that big around. Mm. Um, but I realised, and I was quite scared of them for several years, but then I realised they'd actually come around this one particular snake at a particular time of year, and I could almost work out to the day when it was likely to come, and you'd see its marks on the path all around the house, and it was hunting, it was a nomad that had a yearly round, and it would look for, you know, rats and things like yeah. that, and it would be gone in 48 hours. And I remember once um, I was doing some gardening, and I heard this thud beside me, and this snake had slithered off a rock, so it was literally a metre away from me. It stood up looking at me like that, and I just stood still, and... I realised then we actually had an understanding. He knew me, <laughs> I knew him, and he just went down and, and you know, slithered off. And, and my mortal terror was that a neighbour would kill that snake mm. and then a new snake that didn't know me <laughs> would come in and I'd have to start all over again. <laughs> but, but... Ladies and gentlemen, be careful of what you've just heard. This is what the people who buy tigers and bring them into their houses think. <laughs> Well, that's true, but better the tiger you know than the one you don't know. <laughs> we were talking earlier about um, when we talk about science and art, we tend to think of it as a, a human domain, but perhaps we can extend this discussion and, and, and ask about animals. Um, and we were talking earlier about bowerbirds, uh, for example, which I know you're interested in. I mean, are these animals... Artists? Are they scientists? What do you think? <laughs> we were talking about this, and uh, Tim has some very fine bowerbird <laughs> stories. And to me, it seems that bowerbirds are indeed artists, and they are indeed scientists. Yeah, I, uh, look, uh, what I... Mm, mm, well, there are about 20 species of bowerbirds around about in rough figures and they make the most extraordinary variety of bowers but the, the most complex one I've seen was in northwestern New Guinea in the high mountains there where uh, the bower bird up there is a very plain looking thing, a little olive bird about that big and, um, but it makes this extraordinary bower that would be this high it, it, it takes a, a sapling and strips all of the leaves off it and then builds what looks like a small hut a hut that you'd expect to be built by a goblin or something with a little opening and roof and, and, and a floor, and it'll lay out in that hut uh, clusters of berries or clusters of fungus or whatever it's found, and it has a little garden out the front, which it's made makes with moss and again puts the little seeds there. And this, I, I, the first time I saw this, they tend to build on ridge tops, and I, you know, in New Guinea you walk on ridge tops because it's the best way to get around. And we were between about two and three thousand metres elevation. We'd been walking for three days, hadn't seen any sign of a human being or even a village, nothing at all. Uh, in this very remote forest, and I came across one of these bowers and looked into it, and there, in pride of place, right in front of the little sapling in the middle of the hut, was a ballpoint pen. <laughs> and I thought, has this, how did this get here? The bird is not big enough really to carry it, I would have thought, very far. Has it been traded by bower birds for miles? <laughs> has it been stolen and passed on? Has some, maybe it dropped out of a helicopter? It was... I see it, trade routes of the bowerbirds. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But, but I, I, the one thing I do know is that animals have, I think, almost as great a range of passions and capacities as we do. Bowerbirds have a great sense, aesthetic sense, because if you move one of those little seeds, they hate it. It all has to be just as they <laughs> right, want it. You know. right. um, but but uh, another bird that lives in my area, the lyrebird, lives around our house. It's a very beautiful bird with a long tail, and... Um, they scratch for a living in the dirt. They have an implacable hatred of plants, small plants. And I remember watching this liar bird one morning. I'd planted a daisy bush in the garden, and I just watched it for about half an hour as it pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled until it finally got rid of this damn thing. The amount of energy it put into it and the sort of the intensity of its activity just <laughs> revealed this implacable hatred of plants, <laughs> presumably because the roots get in the way of it being able to scratch. But they, they are, we are animals, so animals are us. Exactly. Absolutely. So we have the bowerbird as a landscape designer and a stage scene designer, um, definitely an artist. 
but I think I remarked before we came out here too, we were talking a bit about this, that, that we don't know what the bowerbird is thinking and the bowerbird may not be considering itself either an artist or a scientist, but a magician. And <laughs> yes, and the piece of magic it performs is mm. to materialize a female bowerbird that will come in and admire its <laughs> right. work and then... <laughs> Right. So that leads us inevitably to sex in science and in the arts. <laughs> you said that any <laughs> oh. I was going to ask you about um <laughs> I must say the um the passages in Bird Cloud where the eagles caught each other are very sexy. Mm. <laughs> Very handsome eagle, that the main one. <laughs> yes, eagle courtships are are uh, fascinating to watch. And we had this one one pair of bald eagles that had raised that successfully raised two young every year. And some of you who are eagle fanciers may know that it's often only one chick that survives. But these had raised two year after year after year after year. And then one of them was electrocuted um, two springs ago, and the remaining eagle, um, after moping about for a week or ten days, flew off down the river, came back with another eagle the next day. That eagle stayed around for one day and then departed again. <laughs> and this, this particular thing has been repeated several times, going out, finding an eagle, bringing her home, if it is a her, I, can, I think it was the female that was electrocuted on the uh, electric wires, the safe kind. <laughs> um, but we also have a pair of golden eagles about half a mile east on the same cliff. Actually, the bulls don't live on the cliff. They live in a tree in front of the cliff, close to the river, because they're fish eaters. But the... Uh, the Goldens were very different. They're exceedingly uh, protective, exceedingly uh, fierce if you come near them. The bald eagles were just, they watched the house being built, they hung around, they knew everybody's uh, face. And to this day, if a stranger comes, the eagles, the bald eagle, the remaining bald eagle will fly over and check out the person. Um, but the Goldens were very, very different, very fierce. I didn't go anywhere near their nest because they come shrieking and bellowing down and chase me back to the house. But um, I called the bald eagles Mr. and Mrs. Bridge after Evan Connell's um, stories, uh, novels of that name, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, because they were so faithful to one another and because they were such great parents. They were really terrific parents. That was just so sad when one of them managed to get Fried. Mm. Yeah. We, we have an eagle here in Australia only called the white-bellied sea eagle, which looks a bit like uh, a big butterfly. I've seen photographs, but that's all. Yeah. <laughs> they, they live around our house on the Hawkesbury River, and we see them every day. Um, and where we live, August is the hungry month. That's when there's not a lot of food around. Right. And um, it's also when the eagles mate, mate up. The young eagles find a pair. And... The, I, I moved, we moved in permanently into this house in, um, with their early August 2006 and uh, I was putting books away on the bookshelf and um, I heard this kind of clattering sound and it was two eagles way, way up high over the bay, about three kilometres away, locked together, mm. twisting like this in a circle. And I'd seen it before, but this time they didn't break apart. They hit the water, it went into the water. And it was an ex the reason they do this. I was wondering why. Are they, I thought maybe it was a territorial fight, but actually it turns out that eagles, when they form, f choose a partner for life, test that partner to make sure that they are the right one for them. And and but the, the more even the match, the more even the love match, the more dangerous because one can't overcome the other, and they become entirely seduced into this this thing, and they fall into the water and drown. So anyway. 
We so all know we, relationships like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but, so anyway, I, I, I could see them both. I got a telescope out and was looking at the water. And look, at these eagles were still fighting each other in the water, still trying to flap their wings and the claws coming out. So I got my little boat and with a little engine on it and a big yard broom that I had and went out about two kilometres into the water, into the, the, the estuary. And these eagles, it was clear water and I could see them still, these magnificent birds still going. And one of them had a big bloody gash on its white chest, Whoa. the smaller one, the male. And I got the yard broom and tried to rescue the male first, but it flapped feebly away and wouldn't come near me. But the female just looked me in the eye. I put the yard broom under her. She grasped the, the, the brush end of it. And I lifted Hold her up. Hand? No, I lifted, <laughs> I lifted her up. She was so heavy because she oh. was wet. And it was, like, it was an immense effort, actually, to try to just lift her up to give her enough height to take off. So I had her over my head, and she just stood there looking at me, kind of got the water off, and then just took off and came within about that far of the water of going in again, but yeah. managed to get enough height to get off and flew to the bank, which left me with the male who's still flopping around in the water. He, he wouldn't grab the broom. He had no faith in me at all that I was trying to do something good Your for arrival, him. Your arrival, obviously. Yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> But anyway, I managed to get use the broom as a sort of a sweep and flip him into the back of the boat. And he fell onto the back seat of the boat and his wings were so wide they hung over each side of the boat. And he just sort of collapsed. His head went down like this as if... And his eye was like that big. It was incredible. So then I had this bird in the back of the boat. So I had to start the engine somehow over him, which I did, and came back into shore and he hadn't moved the whole time. And I then grabbed him... And put the broom under him again and used, and I couldn't touch him because their claws are so powerful, and then lifted him out and just placed him on a rock by the shore. And he was still there about two hours later, stunned, standing, thankfully. Um, but it was one of the most moving experiences mm. I've ever had because, uh, and these eagles, I think, are still a pair around our. I area, was going to ask if, if the female went and found another honey. Or no, <laughs> I think that they were so passionately uh -huh. engaged, that was it, that they. <laughs> Yes. Whole See thing's... what fun this is? <laughs> whole thing sounds like a first marriage. <laughs> I was, um, you mentioned in, in Bird Cloud uh, there's moments where birds finally do fly into your windows and stun themselves. And I think all mm. of us have that experience from time to time. And it is, isn't it a wonderful thing when you think a bird has died? and you realise it was just knocked out, and you go out and it's gone. How good do we feel about that? And it, it, but yet it's yeah, kind of good. those small moments that we um, perhaps should think about more often. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> and I've got my windows plastered with those stupid silhouettes, mm. but if you're outside and you're a bird, somehow the reflection off the light obscures the silhouettes. Yeah. I think maybe I need to backlight them or stick them on the outside, but the wind is so ferocious, they'd be gone in a minute. But, um, I think the best time we ever had with watching the eagles <clears throat> was watching uh, one of them fish. And there are some pretty big trout in the North Platte River. And one of the eagles came swooping down one day and clutched onto a fish in the river, but it was a little too big. And the eagle was not about to let go, and the fish was not about to get away, so down they went. And the eagle was as though on a surfboard going downstream, <laughs> and finally managed to steer the fish into the shallows and, and struggle up onto the bank. It was a large fish, but it was, you could see the little wave out behind the eagle as it went downstream. But you don't get that if you stay in an apartment all the time. You really don't. So I hope everybody here is going to go build a little shack somewhere. <laughs> Spend time in it. Annie, why did you build your shack where you did? What, what is it? That, that environment is so harsh to my eyes and my sense of... Oh, it is harsh, yeah. but for some reason I like that kind of thing. The reason I moved to Wyoming in the first place is because of the sight lines. And as a writer, I find that the solution to knotty problems and working out of characterizations and plots and, and constructing paragraphs and sentences is to walk. 
And somewhere I read that children who are born um, with a kind of paralysis so that they don't have the use of their legs for one reason and another are very, very slow to speak and acquire language skills. But there's something about walking, apparently, and the parents are told, you know, to move the baby's legs like that, even though the baby can't do it themselves. But um, there's something about walking and striding out and looking in far distances that uh, that sets the mind on fire. You know, ideas just come flashing in like tsunamis. And I'm sure everybody here has had that experience, how when you're upset or things are going wrong and crazy or you go out for a walk and it's it's a solution. Partial, <laughs> but, <laughs> but real. I thought, I thought we should talk a little bit about uh, the earth and its future in the, in the broad sense and also in a narrower sense in you know, the future of our own little environments. The science obviously is telling us what's going on. The science is diagnosing the problems that we face, the challenges. What role do you see for art in helping meet those challenges. I, I'm thinking, for example, of um, Cormac McCarthy's novel, The Road, you know, a work of fiction, but has, a, has any book more recently sort of made people aware of the potential for environmental catastrophe? Perhaps not. So can we talk a little bit about the role of the artist in, in this area? Yeah, well, I think, you know, for me at least, art... Well, last night I spoke a little bit about about this, but for those who didn't come to the event last night, um, see, I think what art does is build a model world. People, when they're putting together a novel or they're putting together a play mm -hmm. or a mm -hmm. piece of artwork, they will abstract from the real world a number of factors, and those factors might be a person with a particular personality in a particular situation or whatever, and then they'll manipulate those factors in, in a play to explore what potential outcomes will happen. You know, I mean, Uncle Vanya, Chekhov's Uncle Vanya, you know, just is a recent, mm. recently put on in Australia and a great example of that sort of thing. We're back to place again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's sort of, that is a model world. And what scientists do when they explore how the climate might change is build a model world in exactly the same way. And the reason that we do that is that very complex systems like a human being and it, it's really our relationship with each other can only be explored in that way. We can't do it using a reductionist scientific approach. And I mentioned last night Richard Dawkins' you know, The Selfish Gene, which is the ultimate reductionist mm -hmm. science book and a wonderful book. But in it, Dawkins talks about the love between a mother and a child. And the way he analyses it from the selfish gene theory perspective is that when a child smiles at its mother, it's simply trying to get a larger share of the mother's resources than it would otherwise get. So it's sort of, you know, <laughs> cheating in a sense. And, and while that may be true genetically, it, it is an utterly inadequate description of that phenomenon that binds a mother and child together. And so reductionist science can only take us so far. We have to build model worlds if we want to understand life in its full richness and complexity. And an artist... A writer like Annie d does that in a sense. I mean, any, any work of fiction does that in, in a sense. Mm. I don't know what you think about that, but that's a fair sort well, of... I've, I've been thinking about Thomas More's Utopia and we're skirting toward utopias and a lot of, uh, a lot of writing is utopian and architecture too. Somehow or other, when we talk about the arts... Architecture's shoved off to one side, but it's worth thinking about everything from the design of cities, from conversations about the role of <clears throat> public meeting spaces, plazas, uh, roads converging. All of this sort of thing is, is part of the same discussion, which we don't have time to talk about, but it's fascinating just the same. And there may be some people here who have powerful thoughts on that subject. Well, we will um, t move to questions from the audience quite soon. I just want to touch on another subject before we did that, 
And it's something I want to ask everyone that I speak to at this festival. And it's about an endangered species, Tim, called the book. <laughs> We've been reading a lot lately about you know, the closure of um, <coughs> bookstores in Australia. Uh, in the US, the borders chain went into bankruptcy. And a lot of this is cast in uh, sort of, you know, apocalyptic terms about the decline of books and reading. So I wanted to ask each of you, do you see a future for the book, for reading, and, and what is that future? Annie? Actually, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow evening. Um, but, yes, I see the book as far from dead. I see the book as persisting. In the Los Angeles airport the other day, there was a perfectly furious woman with her uh, Kindle, which had run out of juice, and she was in the, <laughs> the middle of, of some, some uh, gripping yarn. <laughs> so she had it plugged in and was standing there tapping her foot and rolling her eyes. And there were a few people around who had one of those old-fashioned things, turning the pages, no problem. <laughs> But I think, I think uh, the book is too perfect to disappear. Um, you can't take your Kindle to camp for a, long, you know, for a nice long spell. It's going to run out of power if you have one of the best camps that has no electricity or running water. There are thousands of ways in which the book is better. And... It's going to be here. It can't go. It can't disappear. Yes, bookstores are fading, but there are also bookstores surviving, and some of the best ones are sort of skanky little second-hand bookstores that have wonderful things in them. And this is probably the best time ever to buy books, too. Fantastically fine, lavishly illustrated books on arcane subjects, um, are available for very low prices. And there, there's, just, uh, there's just no end to the wonders of the book. You know, something that's lasted for 500 years and that has become part of our lives is not going to go away. The Kindle cannot overcome the book. The Kindle strikes me as perfect for reading manuscripts or detective stories or um, more frivolous stuff, but you want <laughs> the book. You need the book for the beauty of the design, the cover art, the layout, the typography, the shape of the letters on the page, the margins that you can write in. Um, these things are part of the reading experience. and. We need that. Thanks, Annie. Tim? Well, um, the book may survive, but will it be Mills and Boone or will it be something else? And uh, just to give you a sense of the threat that the book is under in Australia, we just look at the current situation. The model for a number of major publishing houses, Australian publishing houses, is they'll acquire a book from an author, pay them an advance, sell the overseas rights to that book to foreign territories, and hopefully some of them will do reasonably well and then we're, we're all happy. But the, the sad fact of the matter is that at the moment it costs substantially more to produce a book in Australia. So that book there, you can buy for $32 at a bookstore in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to Amazon.com, you can buy the UK edition of the book for $15 or its equivalent and have it sent postage free to you in Australia. Um, and what that means, in a way, is the model is broken, you know, and we will end up in a globalised world. We'll follow music and everything else, sport, you know. Everyone used to play sport once and enjoy it. Now you watch it on TV and there's a few teams worldwide who are part of it. Um, uh, how do we uh, foster creative genius and, and reward people for putting in the hard years of work that are required to write a book of significance? Yeah. And in the new model that's emerging, I don't know how that's going to happen yet. And I, I do worry that, um, that the, these globalising trends will result in fewer books being produced, fewer significant books produced globally, and result in a degradation in the quality of books. Now, I might be overly 
worrying, but that's, uh, uh, I, th I think that is true. But um, there's a, a chap in Los Angeles, a book reviewer and omnivorous reader, a guy named Michael Silverblatt, um, who imagines that the path of the book is going to be small, beautiful editions at much higher prices for the real thing. If you look around you, you'll see books as decor. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the spirit, but at the same time, it's disturbing. Um, <laughs> yes, I noticed that too. <laughs> Glad it wasn't my book. <laughs> <laughs> so the, there is that possibility that yes, beautifully designed books, um, books could become a very esoteric thing, but I don't think they're going to disappear. Let's wait and see. Okay, um, you'll be pleased to know, Annie, that your book here has got writing through it, and it's been you, it's been read. <laughs> So I think we'll take some questions from the audience. We have a, a raving microphone, so please just wait till it comes to you. Uh, lady in the front row, perhaps. Um, Andy, your, your idea of place. Um, our early pioneers came here from the United Kingdom, and uh, they came to a country they found harsh and uninviting with upside down seasons. And some of them adapted, some of them, well, some of them didn't adapt, some of them gradually adapted, and some of them had made a home and, um, and grew to love it. Do you, is your sense of place where you come, where you are, where you come from, or does it include where you go to? I didn't get the back part of that. Does your sense of place uh, include where you go to and end up as well as where you came from, I think? Yeah, um, of course. I wasn't speaking about my personal sense of place so much as uh, place as a fountain for story. And that, that, I think, is sort of the basis of what I try to do in writing. But yes, on a personal level, of course, where you came from and where you end up may be very, very different places, and somehow you shake it out in your mind. So I, I like your example, though. I find it very interesting that, that you put it that way, and you put it very well. Was it autobiographical? <laughs> ah. Right. Well, that's an entirely different kind of problem when you go to a place and you can't get back. And I suppose if we look at the long, long, long uh, centuries of migration, that's the situation. You go there and you can't get back. Oh, thank you. Tim. Tim. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. I've been wanting to ask you this question. In your book, uh, The Future Eaters, you said that uh, the last great global warming started about 17,000 years ago and it finished about 10,000 years ago. And you described in quite dramatic terms how the global caps were melting and the world changed. Um, you didn't say how much the ocean rose, but I think it was quite a lot. Uh, and then you said um, that this was only one of 17 that occurred in the last two million years. Yeah. Now, two million years is a drop in the bucket. And my question is, as, these, as this great global warming was not caused by, by coal-fired power stations or little men driving around in Mack trucks and Volkswagens, what... What was the cause of it? And, sure. and am I being unfair in thinking that maybe this is another natural event, perhaps made worse by man? 
Sure. Look, I, I have to take a minute or two to answer that properly for you, but what causes, what has caused the 17 ice ages over the last 2 million years, and they occur roughly at a frequency of about once every 100,000 years, is um, uh, a, a bringing together of changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun, changes in the, the wobble of the Earth on its axis and also the angle of the Earth on its axis. And about once every 100,000 years, they conspire to bring about cool summers in the Northern Hemisphere, which then results in not all of the snow that fell melting. So you have a white ice cap persisting through the summer, and that grows year after year after year until the Earth enters an ice age. And CO2 levels drop as a result of that because the oceans cool, and cool oceans can absorb more carbon dioxide than warm oceans. It's a, it's a bit like a, you know, a can of Coke that's cold. Um, you can open it and it won't froth everywhere. A hot one, you open it and it'll froth because the CO2 has to escape from the liquid. Right? And then at part of that cycle, something changes and we get a situation where there is a very rapid warming on the planet. And again, it's, it's those three cycles, perhaps bringing warmer starts to decay. Then the oceans outgas all of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that reinforces the warming trend and we get into what's called an interglacial. Now the reason this didn't happen before two, uh, two million years ago was that the configuration of the Southern Ocean was different. The Panama Canal was um, still open, that area, the land bridge hadn't formed properly. Drake Passage was somewhat different and anyway, the ocean circulation was different. So only when we got into this rather precise configuration of oceans and continents that prevailed from 2000, 2 million years on did we get these ice ages. Now, we know that pattern very, very well, and we can understand that we can predict when the next ice age will occur, which is about 80,000 years from now, because the last one was 20,000 years ago. What we're seeing today is something we have not seen over all of that 2 million year history, which is an increase in the warming trend. See, the way things have happened is that you get the rapid warming and then a slow decay to the next ice age. Right? For this one, we've got something different. We've had the rapid warming 20,000 years ago. We started experiencing the slow decay in temperatures to go down, and now we've got this spike coming on top of the warming. Nothing like it has ever happened in the last two million years. And we know that this has been caused by a different driver it's not being caused by changes in the Earth's orbit because we can observe that and see that those patterns that have prevailed for two million years have not changed. What's happened instead is that an additional amount of is being released into the atmosphere through the digging up of coal and oil and natural gas and the combustion of those rocks um, to, to increase the CO2 levels in the atmosphere and that is driving the further warming that goes beyond the old cycles. Now, one thing that tends to confuse people is that, of course, the weather has natural cycles within it that are on a much smaller scale than that 100,000-year cycle. There'll be decadal-long cycles and century-long cycles. And in a place like Australia, where weather is extremely variable, it's hard to see the impact of that shift in the baseline of warming, if you want. So people say, oh, look, you know, I don't think global warming's happening because Grandad had a drought that's worse than the one I've seeing now. And that may well be true because regionally you can have very severe droughts that sort of drown out the signal of that rising temperature. But as the temperature rises, we're shifting the baseline. So things like droughts may become more intense and more frequent as we go on. And that's what climate change is about. It's not about weather. It's about a shift in the average of all weathers, which is the climate, if that makes sense. Well, I hope that explains to some extent the question. <laughs> So save your peanut butter jars. <laughs> yeah. I think your first paycheck's in the mail, Tim. <laughs> Question? Uh, someone, there's someone up the back and someone in the middle, Philip. And then the back. Hi. Uh, Tim's last answer relates to what I was going to ask anyway. And, I mean, obviously we had a scientist give us a wonderful description of what is happening. And my, I speak as a scientist, but what do you think the role of art is in informing 
uh, the general population of these uh, of the nature of the science that backs up all these things. We've had a number of examples over the last 50 years, nuclear power, genetic engineering, and now climate change, where the scientists have probably not communicated their science all that well mm. to the world at large. Does art have a role in doing this for them? Well, well of, of course it, it does because you see what we the scientists who are working on aspects of climate change that they're they're reductionist scientists who are working on one tiny bit of a big picture they're a bit like the guy who spent his whole life studying the salivary glands of the wombat you know and if you ask him to explain his work he'll give you a splendid you know explanation of, of of the salivary glands of the wombat but it won't actually satisfy what you want to know um, so it's really hard for those scientists sometimes to come out and explain in a more holistic way um, uh, the significance of their work. And I think there is a role for art, and Cor uh, Cormac McCarthy is a great example, where someone has taken a, an imaginary leap into a possible future world and tried to explain what that means or might mean to us as human beings. So I think that there is a, it's a hugely important role um, and one that reductionist scientists, we can't really expect them to do. We, we need all of the skills that we have as a human family to try to come to grips with complex problems like climate change. And one wonders also why most of us don't have a sense of scale of big change, long, long change. We think so immediately in terms of time, should teachers in schools be giving kids some sense of monstrous pieces of time and of slow change? That sort of thing just in the States, I don't know how it is here, but in the States people never hear about that. So everyone works on their own experience and what they've heard from granddad about the great drought and so forth. People don't get it in terms of scale, and I don't know how you get around that unless you start with kids who are quite young. But who's going to tell? Who's going to teach them? Not going to get it on the telly, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, my question is very similar in that um, what can we do, both artists, scientists, but all of us, to um, counter the, the naysayers that say, oh, no, it's nothing to do with us and it isn't really happening? Well, I, I, the first thing I, I would um, say to people is, why are you so certain about this? What is, what is your basis in it? You know, because no climate scientist is that certain. No climate scientist says... You know, it is absolutely, definitely happening and caused by people. We can observe the warming trend, um, but it's all in, in, in science. Scientists are the greatest sceptics you'll find anywhere. And they'll put up a, a theory, you know, that the world is warming, it's caused by greenhouse gases, and they'll assign a probability to it. And, you know, the, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change simply says it's 90% or more certain that humans are causing this warming. So uh, if you've got someone who said, I absolutely know the answer, they're almost certain to be a charlatan and we need to ask why they think that. And, and really the, the job they then have is to say, well, the 10% possibility that the climate scientists admit might be real, that's, my, that's what I think is actually happening, but we need to know from them why they believe that. On what basis do they believe that? Any more questions? Uh, oh, okay, at the back there, and then... Hi, a question for Tim. Um, if greenhouse emissions continue to be like they are now, um, what kind of change in weather patterns could we be looking at in the next, I don't know, 20 years? Yeah, sure. The only way that that can be answered is on the basis of probabilities. You know, there's a, there's a probability a certain event will happen. But I want to use that question to explain how a shift in the baseline affects the frequency of events. And... One of the best studied areas of climate change, and the one we know qu quite a lot about in, in, in more detail and we can project with more certainty about, is sea level rise. 
And the reason we can do that is that the oceans absorb heat at a, at a known rate, and we can, we can observe this kind of steady increase in the ocean level as they get warmer, because, you know, warm water takes up more space than cold water, and also ice melts and so forth. Our federal government has projected that we need to be aware that sea levels may rise by, you know, 1.1 metres in the next 90 years, and we're now doing modelling work to show what that might mean around our coasts. But what is not well understood is that even if sea levels rise by only half of that, and they rise by half a metre over the next uh, 90 years, what that will do is take what is normally a once in a hundred year inundation due to a storm and high tide or whatever, you know, causing inundation. It takes that and makes that one in a hundred year event an event that you can expect to see either every month or ten times every month, right? Because you've shifted the baseline that these events are coming off. So that when we talk about the increased frequency of extreme events, that's the nature of it, that we shift the, we shift the average just a bit upwards, but that means that rare events become much, much more common. So we need, that's the way to understand the potential impacts, really, of climate change on a whole lot of mm. physical aspects of our world. That's precisely what has happened where I live. Last year at Bird Cloud, we had a 100-year flood. The last big flood was in 1912, and the water came within 30 feet of the house. This winter, the snowpack in the mountains, and Bird Cloud is located at the north end of a valley with the northern end of the Sierra Madre on the southwest, and on the east, the Medicine Bow Range of the Rockies. This year, the snowpack is 175% of something we call normal, um, which is was it an average over a certain number of years. But the problem is much more complicated than just a lot of snow in the mountains. Unfortunately, in the pa past decade, the um, pine bark beetle has gotten into the lodgepole pines uh, in the Rockies, and this was a monoculture tree. There was a lot of it all the way from British Columbia down through the states, except for Idaho, which had a mix of forest. And all of those trees are dying and dead. Whole forests are just these withered gray things that are beginning to fall down. In the spring in the past, when snow began to melt, the trees would absorb the water. But dead trees do not absorb any meltwater at all. So are we going to have another 100-year flood or not? That's my question right now. I'm trying to tear my hair out to get an answer from the insurance agent about flood insurance. <laughs> uh, so we could have another 100-year event this year, two years in a row. But there it is. You know, a lot of small things it gets warmer earlier by a couple of days. The water begins to melt. The trees don't take up the moisture, and here we go. 